Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dan, the voice behind that Kaito Dan, and welcome to my review for Ruby Volume 4 Chapter 11, Taking Control. Before we begin, just a quick update on Ruby's future, namely in regards to Volume 5 that's been revealed to drop in the fall this year, and the comedy spin-off Ruby Chibi will be returning for a second season this May. Just like last year, I will be doing reactions for Chibi, so be on the lookout for that, as well as any future updates on Volume 5 and beyond. As for now, just be mindful that this video will contain spoilers, so watch at your own risk. And here we are, the penultimate episode of the volume. After quite a wild time last week looking in on Ren and Nora's past, it's time to begin to see how Volume 4 will close. But can it set up the finale on a high note? or leave it with a lot to do to end strong. Let's find out. We open on Cinder trying to master her new powers, as she wipes out a group of Grimm with one blow. Though it's not without some effort, the Spitfire panting hard as a result, and not holding her ground at all well. Plus she only just manages to get one over on a sudden Beringal charge. Cinder's recovery doesn't look 100%, and it's making the attempts to truly make the full maiden power her own a difficult task, much to the displeasure of Salem, who's been watching on. The Wicked Witch scolds her pupil harshly, especially for not living up to her aspirations of having power. She's gotten it in her grasp, yet in Salem's eyes, she's holding back, perhaps due to her injuries or challenges with whatever Salem was teaching Cinder to control a few episodes ago. Either way, Cinder hasn't reached the level her boss feels she should be at by now. But before she can continue, a third face appears. Tyrion, finally getting back to HQ with his dismembered tail between his legs, pleading for Salem to forgive him for failing to capture Ruby. Much to the Faunus' dismay, however, he's not so lucky. Salem's stone-faced with the update, even to the news of Crow being poisoned, who we know has been a Fawn in their side for a while now. Salem then makes a comment about the last eye being blinded, which I'm not too sure what to make of. The best I could speculate is in regards to Crow being Ospin's right hand man, his eyes across the world while he maintained Veil. Vale. Crow seems to be the last one privy to the location of the Veil vale relic, and if Crow dies, it would become tougher to find that relic so Salem could be frustrated there, even if it means one last foe against her. Another avenue though includes Raven. Raven seems quite sharp on things that could happen in the world, given her speculations on the fate of Beacon and Ospin coming true. Many in the fandom do believe that Raven could have the same semblance as her brother, another hereditary one like the Schnee Glyphs perhaps. We know Crow can bring misfortune, or at least he can foresee future misfortune on the way, so what if Raven has the same power, or some other form of foresight ability? The reason this could fit into Salem's comments, is we know even with keeping track of things at a distance, Raven's not affiliated with Ospin's side. With Raven not working for or against her, and Crow close to death, that could leave Salem without anyone with these strong foresight skills to rival against her schemes. It's another of those thin elements that does need more time and clues for us to get a better grasp to its meaning. But regardless of what the last eye is, or any positives to be gained, Salem is still not fond of Tyrion's failure, voicing her disappointment clear as day as she exits. This is a big body blow for Tyrion. We know how highly he ranks Salem, seeing the villainess as his queen, his goddess. Hearing such comments from Salem, feels like a dagger in his already open wounds. So seeing the twisted Scorpio break down into tears and screams isn't surprising to see really. What is surprising is what follows. Tyrion taking out his frustrations on a nearby Grimm, viciously slashing his sadness and pain away. This isn't slaying a Grimm or some form of self-defense, it's a full-on slaughter and I actually love it. It's so wild and unsettling, backed up with a bone-chilling performance from Josh. Seeing Tyrion go from pain screams with tears flowing down his face, to a warped smile and laughter bellowing out as he moors into this monster, it's a haunting yet awesome sight. The guy has officially snapped, and that can only mean he's far more dangerous now more than ever. 
the next time he has a mission, he'll go even more extreme just to win back his queen's favour. Cinder, by the way, witnesses this entire scene, and her face paints quite the picture. She's not smiling seeing someone who pestered her in the past now here in pain. She's got that look of shock with maybe a hint of fear and caution. I imagine she could be fretting over what may happen to her if she continues to disappoint Salem, especially if Ospin does come back. This may be the kicker for her to finally push herself into mastering her new abilities, just to stay on Salem's good side. Also, I've seen some people think that this could lead to a Cinder face turn for her to become someone good, and I don't buy it. While she could one day try and break off on her own, or even just play an anti-hero or an anti-villain role, I doubt Salem would let the full maiden power slip from her grasp without consequences, and Cinder does still want to be the strongest. I think even with all this madness she's witnessed, she'd rather be on Salem's good side and keep her role as the full maiden than throw it all away. Plus, she's just got too much blood on her hands. So, no, I think this just cements Cinder now needing more than ever to do her best to not fail again. Onto something more positive, we're back in Patch, as Yang has given her new arm a paint job. Looks nice alongside her remaining Ember Celica gauntlet, though I will miss the sleek silver look. I guess that's the Full Metal Alchemist fan in me. But that's not all, Yang even busts out the old faithful Bumblebee, clearly telegraphing her intentions to get back into the game at last, though not before Tai Yang pops in for a chat. Thankfully, he's not here to stop Yang from leaving, he just wants a better goodbye than Ruby's letter. Well, that, and he's also curious about Yang's destination. See, despite numerous mentions not to, he knows Crow informed Yang on Raven's current location, and Tai accepts Yang still wants to confront her mother. He won't stop Yang from going to her, it's just Ruby is also out there in the world, and they both know she's on the way to Mistral, and could possibly do with her sister's aid. So the question is, what will Yang do? Follow her sister, or look for Raven? We don't get an answer in this short scene, but it is still an effective one. It's great to see Yang is primed to leave, even if she's not 100% recovered mentally, let alone physically. And the tease of what is her next step has me looking forward to the next scene from her. I would be cool with either option, honestly, though I would take her going to Ruby, as I feel she could use some more family support right now. Though saying that, we did last see Raven in Anima, so unless Raven is now left for somewhere else, Yang could at least still head to the same continent, no matter the call. I'm also curious about Tai. With the way he acts in this discussion, I get the vibe that he won't be going as well, which would be a surprise given how he seemed to want to go after Ruby in the past. I'd love for Tai to not be left behind in Patch, and imagine if Yang does offer C and Raven, and Tai comes with. We could end up seeing a reunion between Yang's parents, which I think would be an awesome moment to witness. We next head north to Atlas, and with Weiss finally on the move, with Klein there for the assist too, and the pair head out, even with Weiss's loud heels not really being the best footwear for stealth. The two do make good progress, though I will admit, I am surprised we didn't see any staff for them to dodge along the way. Regardless, the two have to split up at one point, as Klein's called in to aid Whitley. Won't lie, I did begin to get worried here for the butler, and for the success of a clean getaway but it does lead into Weiss finding herself outside her father's office in time to hear another argument between Jacques and Ironwood, who's particularly steamed today. It seems Winter, who has been stationed in Mistral, recently passed on a report to Ironwood, who Jacques feels stole his daughter away from him. Bit of an added layer to this already strained relationship there. Bet Winter saw Ironwood's army as a ticket to break free from Jacques, and Ironwood was just happy to oblige. Beyond that, Things are starting to get a little bit interesting right now in Mistral. There's signs of people, dust, and weapons on the move, which definitely sounds like another attack is on the horizon, though Jacques just thinks the general is fretting over nothing. Despite this, Ironwood also feels that someone named Leo won't be able to handle whatever is looming, and Atlas must act accordingly to the danger. Sounds like this Leo is the headmaster of Haven, and given the lion element often tied to that name, I'm willing to bet he's Ruby's resident cowardly lion rap, and not Tai Yang as many have speculated. But yes, 
Ironwood feels with this threat growing, it's time he puts his foot down, and the first step will be a pretty big one compared to the dust embargo. In a week's time, Atlas's borders will close. No one can get in, no one can get out. Which of course Jacques won't like since that will cripple even more profit from his dust business. Still, this is a pretty drastic call to make. It's basically shutting out the world just to protect the people of Atlas from being a target themselves. An action influenced by Ironwood's emotions, feeling if Ospin listened to him in the past, things wouldn't have ended up as they did back in Beacon, or at the very least, more lives could have been saved. Thing is, James, you're kind of forgetting that no matter how Ospin responded to your actions, you still would have had your army hacked by Cinder. Your forces would have still been used against you, so unless you got more up your sleeve, I hope this isn't your only action. I get he still has good intentions in mind, but it's also one with some very big possible negatives. Keep Atlas safe while others are at risk of a grim fate, and that may bring in some even stronger negative views on the kingdom than there already is. And in the case of Weiss, this means she has a week to get out of Atlas, before reaching her friends becomes a tougher task to complete with a border lockdown, even more so with the council's approval needed to be even considered fit to leave, though Jacques claims that would be Ironwood's sole decision instead, which doesn't really get shot down by the general with two seats on the council and the army at his command. Basically, he's got the clout to make these decisions, and it seems unlikely anyone can counter his demands. So as he says to Jacques personally, best stay on his good side. The conversation has reached its end, and Weiss still hasn't gone away. So she quickly glyph locks the door to keep her presence from being known, and she hightails it to the library, where Klein is on hand to reveal a hidden passage. Because of course there's one. It's like the Manor Library code to have one stashed away. It's here before parting with Klein that Weiss finally reveals her next move going to see Winter in Mistral, despite things sounding less than pleasant right now over there. At least with Winter, she can be with someone familiar to help her goals, since sadly Klein won't be coming. The two parting ways for now. This means that we can now switch to Menagerie, to see a wounded but recovered son wake up with Blake close by. This near loss of another friend, sparking Blake to finally share on her reasonings for leaving everyone behind. She didn't want anyone else to get hurt because of her, not even letting Sun argue her point before continuing this emotional outburst. After Yang got hurt from someone affiliated with Blake's past, and now Sun getting hurt in a similar fashion, this is the last straw. Blake would rather be alone, even if she hates being away from those she grew to love dearly. She'll accept that, and even hopes that the others hate her for leaving, just as long as no one else ends up with the same fate as Sun and Yang. She'll go it alone, the only one facing the consequences of her decisions. It's fair for her to not want anyone to get hurt like this, but obviously this is a very unhealthy mindset to have, and she doesn't deserve to be alone. Thankfully, Sun gets his time to speak, basically calling Blake out for being selfish, not selfless, when it comes to her friends being in her life. While she may have chosen wanting to go it alone from now on, that doesn't mean she can stop Ruby, Weiss, Yang, Sun, and everyone else who loves and cares for her to choose for themselves if they want to stay and defend her. They want to look out for Blake like friends do, and even if things like this happen, Sun would happily take getting hurt if it means Blake is safe, something he knows Yang would feel too, not blaming Blake for what happened with Adam. The cat girl may think she's saving her friends from being hurt, but in actuality, she's hurting them herself by pushing them away, not even letting the others have the choice to support her and make sure she's happy too. Thank you so much, son. This is exactly what Blake needed to hear. Yeah, it's been said before that Blake can't take everything on her shoulders, but this feels like the next level of that counterbelief. This isn't Blake's battle anymore. It's everyone's because they want Blake to be happy. Blake doesn't deserve to be alone, and friends stick together through thick and thin, and Blake does need to understand that. This advice also coming from someone who she saw nearly get killed really makes this message come off stronger I feel as well, even more so from someone who Blake's been pushing away for most of this volume, never truly understanding or accepting why it is that Sun was willing to stand by her in these trying times in her life. The monkey boy is also happy to get back into the fight if it means round 2 with Ilya, wanting payback for his wounds. 
This leads into Blake finally starting to see reasoning, and she even calls Cern her hero, a nice callback to when she didn't join the Sea Dragon battle, which makes it even more pleasing when Carly falls in just like Sun did before, with both Belladonna parents having been listening in on this equally tender moment. Won't lie, I laughed my head off with that, and just like before, it's a silly but charming way to move into the more dire situation. Turns out, as I assumed, that was Ilya's scroll that the two youngsters acquired from the spy. We can even see some files that seem to tie into the White Fang, one being labelled Assignment and the others being E.L, P.R, E.W, S.F and an untitled file. There's no way in hell that I can speculate on what these initials mean, but who knows, they may be hints to future elements that we'll see in the White Fang side of things, so at least keep this image in mind for now. Anyway, Gira did manage to scope something out of its contents. Signs that Adam aims to take over as the White Fang leader, and there's also plans for another academy attack, this time at Haven. Guess this means the concept of Adam leading a splinter group is actually a thing, and not just a cover up the Albane twins made to hide the White Fang as a whole being involved in the attack on Beacon. Not surprised honestly that Adam would want to lead the group himself, since he's so dedicated to his dark approach to Faunus benefiting actions and with his cold hatred of humans. Perhaps he sees Sienna Khan as failing to truly retaliate against their enemies, as well as someone in the way of Salem's goals since he's still tied with her faction. This proposed mutiny could also tie into Hazel's meeting with the current White Fang leader as well, since Adam was the one who set that up. Maybe as one final chance for Sienna to willingly yield control over to Adam and side exclusively with Salem, or suffer the White Fang being taken by force. Regardless, the most pressing matter is Haven. With Adam's splintered Fang aiming at the Academy, alongside the apparent hubbub happening in Mistral right now from Winter's report, it definitely sounds like plans to attack Haven have reached a boiling point, and it's time for the folks in Menagerie to act in turn. Sun suggests taking down the Fang once and for all, but Blake has a better idea. Something I personally was hoping to see become a future goal for her, and it looks like I'm gonna get it. Cause Blake doesn't want to destroy the White Fang, she wants to take it back. Blake is gonna try to lead an effort to reclaim the faction and change it back to a group echoing its better, less violent days. Which means soon, we'll finally get a better look at the White Fang as a whole. Now Blake feels she's ready to confront the White Fang issue head on, with support from friends and family this time in a corner. But before we close out the episode, there's just one tiny little detail left to focus on, as we see Ren and Nora rushing back to Ruby and Jean in Kuro Yuri, knowing full well the grin from their past is heading their way. Ren's notably fearful of the beast possibly killing more people close to him, but the pair do make it to their friends first, who are on edge having heard that screech from the end of last episode. But before Ren can inform them what's going on, the lad is stunned into silence. His calmness is shattered and he drops to the floor, because his worst fears have come true. As the theme loses Naturi from Grim Eclipse plays in the background, the Grim Beast has arrived, and it is indeed the one from his past. And even though we only see a glimpse of it, the episode ends with the sight of the creature's two heads. One, the horse head, breathing pitch black smoke, and the other, its rider. This arrow covered hellish clicking sight, acting as our final image before next week's finale. While not as intense as the last two penultimate episodes of a volume, I will say this was a very enjoyable watch that did quite a fair bit for not just the upcoming finale, but also volume 5, and it did so quite well in my eyes. It was a welcome sight to begin with an update on Cinder and Tyrion's condition, and I dug how Tyrion's breakdown could push Cinder into breaking through her current issues. This set piece at the very least gave a sense that even the villains have a lot to learn themselves, which I welcome. It's always nice to see that as much as the heroes need to grow and fall sometimes, the bad guys can too, to make them become an even bigger threat. And now with a broken Tyrion, and a Cinder who will likely push herself harder to not fail her mistress anymore, it sets up the two of them becoming an even stronger and more fearful force for the good guys to clash with. Yang and Tai Yang, as mentioned before, was a very simple scene, but it did the job well that it set out to do, teasing which path Yang will take fine, with no real issues or confusion. 
and I equally enjoyed Weiss's scene as well. Though I will admit I am sad her escape wasn't a night involved wrecking ball exit in defiance of her father. Plus, as I said before, I think we could have done with the odd member of staff roaming the halls to act as a small dose of tension during the escape. But at the very least, it did lead into a sweet goodbye with Klein and the scene with Ironwood and Jacques. I just hope Whitley didn't somehow discover the ploy from the butler and will attempt to confront Weiss in the tunnels. We'll see soon enough. I'll admit, I am shocked that Ironwood has dropped back into a bit more of his stern and stubborn nature that was familiar in Volume 2, but I'm curious how things will go down, especially in Ironwood's neck of the woods, where he's got more freedom, more to prove after past mistakes, and without a filter to his lofty orders like with Ozpin. Could Ironwood become a tyrant? A future foe? Or maybe just a foolish man with good intentions, but with the wrong moves? One to keep an eye on for sure, but it does add into another possible test for Weiss in the future, if she aims to rebuild Atlas's credibility and not just that of her family's. I still wonder if Weiss may find herself at Mantle, and with this lockdown concept, this could end up being a thing, especially if the lockdown is in effect before Weiss can get out. Maybe Jacques might support Ironwood just so Weiss is at least close enough to hunt back down, and in Mistral, Weiss might be able to gain support to aid her cause. A big positive definitely came out of the menagerie scene though, with Blake finally starting to see some of the holes in her logic. As much as a big issue for her has been facing her fears, one of Blake's biggest difficulties has been accepting the help of others, and with the bonds that she's made starting to creep back into her life again, it seems like it's going to be a good sign for her, to help her finally understand that she doesn't have to carry her burdens alone. This also sets up the eventual reunion with her team, and most importantly, Yang, quite nicely I feel. Now Blake is starting to realise her mistakes, and it'll be intriguing how Blake aims to apologise for her actions next time they meet. But I'm so glad she's looking to open up again after falling into a hole, which will help her feel braver as she heads into a new avenue for her story involving the White Fang, which I'm thoroughly excited for. Sun was excellent in this episode by the way, some people have forgotten that Sun isn't just the wild child with a goofball nature. Think back to the end of Volume 1, where he was quick to aid Blake, even dumbed down his joke at points just to be serious when it comes to Blake's emotions regarding the White Fang. The guy can be mature, and I feel he's had a bad rep this volume, either being seen as far too silly for this emotional chapter in Blake's arc, or a hassle to deal with and watch. Yet it's that dedication to his friend and his willingness to stay by her side that comes good here as the firm counter to Blake's harmful fall process. He's more than just the comic relief, and good job to the crew beef for shining a spotlight on that factor. And good job too for the strong ending, sitting up what should be a nail biting volume closer with the Knuckle of V fight, which, even with just a tiny bit more of its look shown, continues to look absolutely fearsome. Such a great creature just on the mystique and the design alone, as well as that kind of reaction that it brings out of someone like Ren. The Kruby have done a really good job making this beast feel like a true terror that deserves this nightmarish credibility to it. Serving as the source of so much pain for Ren, this, I hope, at least will lead into a victory or survival next week that will make it even more sweeter. Please let these guys survive, Kruby. As for voice acting praise of the episode, there does feel like one strong contender, though I do want to give additional props to Michael Jones as Sun for his solid job with a grounded side of Sun that he doesn't get to play enough. Though yes, the biggest praise does have to go once more to Josh Grell as Tyrion for a wonderfully powerful and tormented performance. And now folks, we wait. Only a few days now until this volume wraps up. Where has the time gone? It doesn't feel that long ago where we were just off that character short teasing what's in store for the next chapter of this grand tale. And now we're here after another entertaining episode, chomping at the bit near the climactic end. While not as bombastic as some of its predecessors, this second to last episode did its job well enough to please me. Not just as the setup for the finale of the volume, but as the start of the bridge that will connect events and arcs into the next run. Consider me one pumped viewer, ready for what signs off Volume 4. But what about you guys? How did you feel about this near final entry in the volume? Let me know in the comments down below, and as you do, perhaps like and fade the video, 
and be sure to hit the subscribe and bell buttons to get wise to every new video as they drop. Plus, follow me on Twitter at ThatKaitoDan for all kinds of Ruby related posts as well as future video updates and more. But until next time folks, have a good day or good night, and peace out.